All right, well, thank you everyone for joining. Um, one of the things I wanna say is throughout this presentation, if you have any questions about anything I'm talking about, please put them into the uh, chat window. I'll try to address them at the end. We will have time at the end for questions as well. And when I say any questions, I always look at it like this. If when I'm talking, you ever have one of those head tilt moments where you kind of go, huh, well, that's, that's the question, right? So just ask it and uh, we'll address it. And if I can't address it immediately, then I will definitely uh, get back to you as soon as possible. So what I want to talk about today is what is shift left? I think a lot of people are starting to hear about this and just wanted to speak about it. I come from now a security background and uh, previously from a software development background. And so this is near and dear to my heart. And uh, I think that it will be impactful just for everyone going forward. So who am I and why should you care? Um, you know, uh, thank you very much for the introduction and it touched on a lot of this, but you know, 20 years in the application development space, uh, 15 years as a production Java and .NET developer. So I was writing production code. It was going to production. Um, I was dealing with production issues. <laughs> so five years as a technical instructor for software administration and application development. So I've actually taught people how to do these things. Um, I did consult for five years for Fortune 500, 100, and Global 50 companies. Uh, did, spent 15 years architecting and building deployment automation. So that's really what shifting left is about, is integrating security into deployment automation. Uh, and I spent 10 years doing DevSecOps. So before they even called it DevOps or DevSecOps, uh, I was doing it. And you're going to find throughout your career that that happens, right? You're going to do something. And then years later, someone's going to go, oh, we're doing XYZ. And you're like, well, I did that, but I didn't know there was a name for it. So I've done it from both sides, both as an application developer and technical lead and from uh, being the head of security, trying to secure it as well. So that's me in a nutshell. Uh, I want to also tell you, if you have any questions after this, please feel free to reach out to, reach out to me on LinkedIn and uh, I'll answer any questions that you might have. So why security? Well, that I think in general, people know that we need to be secure, but I, li I always like to get to the why should we be secure? And there's actually numbers that go with it. And so significant financial and reputational harm will be caused by any data breach, period. It's even a suspected data breach can potentially impact your company. Uh, there are numbers that go along with this. Uh, these are 2013 numbers, the first two, which is per incident. It's estimated that it's about five and a half million US dollars for a company to deal with just a data breach in general, regardless of size. That can be broken down to approximately 188 to $277 per record. So I'm not sure if you know, but an Excel spreadsheet on a single tab can have up to a million records. So if you were to look at a single tab of an Excel spreadsheet, if you were to have personally identifiable information or company confidential information, and that were to get out in some way, shape or form, then your company could be looking at a quarter of a billion dollars of impact to it. So that's something that we really want to internalize, right? And that's a great talking point when we talk about risk and why a company should care is financial. Um, New York State Department of Financial Services states that each potentially compromised record can result in a $1,000 fine. So if you're talking about millions of records, which if we're talking about data lakes is not unheard of, in fact, that's on the low end of a data lake, then you're talking about a large amount of money. The Equifax data breach, actually, they stated back in 2017, 2018, that they had already spent a billion and a half dollars without counting for legal fees. So, you know, that's the financial aspect, but what's the reputational? Do you ever want 
anyone from your company sitting in front of a U.S. Senate hearing talking about what happened? The answer is simply no. You don't want to be on a newspaper talking about <clears throat> the failings that you had in security. So that's what I mean by significant financial and reputational harm. And our threat environment is dynamic and evolving. It's continuing to grow, and I'm going to touch on that in a, a little bit. But the silver lining behind all of this is that most of the exploited vulnerabilities had been published for more than a year. So what we're talking about is there are not zero, a lot of zero-day vulnerabilities out there, a lot of vulnerabilities that no one knew about. Most vulnerabilities are published, and they have published fixes. And so what we have to do is we have to start internalizing that. And that's where the shift left idea comes in. How do we internalize security to the point that we are not putting our companies at risk financially or reputationally? So, you know, uh, memes and pictures are always great. So what is security though? It's people, rules, and tools. So it doesn't matter how much uh, how many tools you have or how many processes or rules you have, right? As it says, you know, we have all these great things in this corner and this other corner, we have Dave. Now, it just happens that that's the person that they chose, the name they chose, and that happens to be my name. But the real thing is human error, right? Human error is the thing that really impacts security across the entire uh, spectrum. And so, what we want to do is we want to minimize that as much as possible. So how did we get here? I'm a firm believer that the only way to figure out how to go forward is to look at how we got here in the first place. So from the software development side, way back in 2000s and earlier, we were all part of Waterfall, right? So if you were really great at Waterfall, I mean really great, you were releasing once every three months. Most companies released annually or semi-annually, right? So we're talking huge differences, right? So Waterfall, a whole lot of preparation goes in, a whole lot of development, not a lot of uh, integration with the business. And deployment times are really low and correlation does not equal causation, but you had monolithic applications. And so the best way to think of a monolithic application is like a skyscraper, right? I'm gonna use the Empire State Building as an example, but whatever uh, skyscraper comes to mind is the one that you wanna use. It is huge. It took a long time to build. There's very minimal change that can be done to the outside of the skyscraper. Once it's in place, it doesn't move. So that's waterfall. And at the same time, we were dealing with monolithic applications. Well, then we started to move to agile. And at the same time, roughly, we started to go into service oriented architectures. We started to break apart these monolithic applications, figuring that if we have services, then we can uh, better affect change. Deployment times started to decrease. You're starting to do agile. You're starting to talk about release times in months and weeks instead of years. So Agile comes in, our deployment times are decreasing, where once again, correlation does not equal causation, but we do see that service-oriented architecture is picking up. And now we get to where we are today, where a lot of people are talking DevOps or DevSecOps. Deployment times have dropped through the floor. We're dealing with microservices. So what we're dealing with is now we have the people that are saying that they're doing, you know, 200, 300, 600 releases a day, that they're releasing every six seconds or every 20 seconds. They have some sort of release because we've gotten away from this monolithic idea and we've gotten to this microservice idea. Not only at the same time have we gotten to this microservice idea, but we've also embraced DevOps, which allows for continuous integration and continuous deployment. So if a monolithic application is a skyscraper, microservices is like a campground. If you've ever gone camping, there are prepared areas that you can go and you can uh, set up your tent, but it's a very ephemeral state. 
different people come in. You can set up a tent for hours or days, but usually not longer than a few days. You tear it down, you leave, someone new comes in. So what we have is a environment that changes rapidly. And that's a good thing. So we have DevOps that's enabling that. We've gone from waterfall to DevOps. We've gone from deployment times and measured in months to deployment times measured in hours. And we've gone from monolithic applications to microservices. So what does this mean to security? Well, well as deployment times decrease, our threat environment increases. Personally, from a security standpoint, I would much rather secure a monolithic application. It's really easy. You usually just have to secure some entry points and all the communication happens internally. Great from a security perspective, not great from the software development perspective or from an agility perspective. So as we go to this microservice environment, our threat environment is increasing. You can look at the threat perimeter. Instead of having just a few entry points, now every microservice is an entry point. And we have to start looking at that and we have to secure those. So, you know, dynamic and evolving is the threat environment. And what do I mean by this? It's simple time to compromise. So Verizon does a data breach investigative report, DBIR, and you can go and you can download it for free. And I highly suggest you do it. It's an annual thing and they do not, uh, they don't really create any spam out of it uh, for your email. But every year they provide information about really what's going on from a data breach approach. And this came from, I believe, 2018. Time to compromise now is measured in minutes. If you click a ransomware link, your hard drive will be encrypted with ransomware in under a minute. That's just what happens. So time to compromise is measured in minutes. And time to exfiltration, exfil is when they actually get the data out of your environment, is measured in days. So you really have to stop these vulnerabilities before they even start. And so the attacks are out there. And what I do is I liken security and everything that we do to, uh, if any of you know about like a club on your car or a car alarm, right? It's going to stop a person that wants a car, a car alarm or a club or anything else. But if someone wants your car, it's going to be really hard to stop. So what we have to do is we have to figure out how to get there before we have to decrease that risk, work on the vulnerabilities that we know that exist because compromise in minutes, that's tough. Exfiltration in days, that's tough. So we need to get ahead of it. And so that's where shift left comes into play. So Shift left, what is it? <laughs> the goal of shift left is really simple. It's to reduce cost and risk to the company. So the company cares about cost, money, and it cares about risk. And part of that risk is reputational, part of it is financial. The cost is measured in developer time. Anytime a developer is working on something, they are, they're being paid a salary or they're a contractor and they're being paid hour, hourly, but they are costing the company for the time that they are spending. Anytime that there is a vulnerability, a vulnerability is just a bug. So if you're writing code that has vulnerabilities in it and then a vulnerability is identified, well, you're gonna have to pay to fix that vulnerability. And then company expenditures. A lot of what people don't think about is the business aspect to it. Say you're writing code and you have a great thing and then the business goes, we love this. This is the next big thing. We're going to market it and this is gonna be our differentiator. So the company goes out and they start marketing and they start 
<clears throat> spending money on ads. Maybe they have a Super Bowl ad. Maybe they, you know, uh, do ads in other places, but they're talking to their vendors and they're hyping this thing that you're writing. If you have a vulnerability or something that stops you from going to production, well, the company now has to figure out how do we recoup that cost? Because if you can't release on the date that you stated, once again, reputational harm, but also monetary harm because they have out and they have to share a marketing strategy. So these are the things that DevOps and Shift Left are trying to stop, is we're trying to stop developer time being done on things that aren't directly impactful to the application. We're trying to stop company expenditures going to waste. And we're trying to reduce risk. And by the way, when you're ever speaking with a business, always speak in risk terms, because that's a term that business understands. Once again, reputation. You don't want to have breaches. You don't want to have, be known as uh, having vulnerabilities. If you are shipping software and that software is not secure or that software is buggy, then the reputation of the company and the reputation of the software is at stake. So the goal with DevOps is to reduce and eliminate that impact to the reputation by ensuring that what we do is we deploy a solid product that is secure, that meets the customer's needs. Business impact, we wanna reduce that. We want the business to be able to utilize the product. We want the business to be happy with the product. And from both a business and a developer point of view, we want to limit the schedule impact. We want to be confident that what we're doing is going to meet the requirements, meet the deadlines that have been out there. So quick iterations, DevOps, quick deployments, microservices are all these things that allow us to get there. Once again, it's easier to change a campground than to change a skyscraper. So I don't know if you've seen this, but this is uh, kind of the traditional DevOps diagram that we talk about. And everything is related. And the idea is once again, that you're doing continuous integration and continuous either de uh, deployment or uh, development. So CI CD, you know, you always have planning, you have code, build, test, release, deploy, operate, monitor. They all feed into each other and they're all happening at the same time. So when we get to the shift left idea, this is what we mean. What we wanna do is we wanna push security and we wanna push our processes to the left of this diagram. And so that's what shift left means. So we want to have everything integrated throughout the entire process. We want people thinking about security as they're planning and coding. We want testing to happen and we don't, we want unit testing and we want secure testing to happen. When the release happens, we need to ensure that what we're releasing actually works. That when it deploys, it's functional. And we have continuous testing involved in all of these, both security, functional, operational. You can break a build if it doesn't work. You know, as it's operating, you're checking to make sure that the status is working correctly. And just to let you know, every single section of this um, process, we could spend hours speaking about. <clears throat> so this is definitely very high level. But the idea is, once again, that what we're doing is we're shifting security to the left and we're shifting process automation to the left. And what DevOps once again allows is for this process to be a, both a feedback loop and to allow for increased velocity, meaning we can do more deployments with more confidence, faster and easier. Now, what you see on the bottom is the cost. <clears throat> so if you have a vulnerability, which is just a bug, so we can speak in terms of bugs, and NASA did a great research article on it and the links down below. What they identified is <clears throat> if you identify the bug when you're coding, the earlier in the process you identify it, the less cost it is. 
So if it's X when you're just doing planning and coding and building, it is a hundred times more costly once it's out in the production environment to make that fix. So once again, cost reduction, right? We, what you want to do is you want to identify bugs, whether they be code bugs or vulnerabilities, security vulnerabilities, as early in the process as possible, because that reduces the cost to the company. If you get a production bug, it's going to be a hundred times as costly to address it. And look at it like this. There are companies that have software that generates revenue in the millions of dollars a minute, sometimes millions of dollars a second, depending on the company. So what happens if you have a bug and you have a production outage? Every second that that application is not doing what that application is supposed to be doing, the cost is racking up to the company. So that's why shift left is so huge. We identify things early, we fix them early, we have confidence as we do our deliveries. We have confidence that what we've deployed works. So once again, if you take anything away, take away that number down at the bottom. Finding it early reduces the cost to the company significantly. So to me, I think that shifting left is even bigger in the fact that what we need in what has to happen is we need to shift left to the developer. Because if we shift left to the developer, then the cost is actually zero. Now, there's a certain aspect of just training in the fact that you need to train that developer to think in a secure way. And that training happens a lot from, um, well, your developer training, I mean, your CS, right? You're learning about these things now. You're learning about the algorithms and the uh, optimizations and how best to write code so that it's maintainable and everything else. But learning to also secure it so that you aren't introducing vulnerabilities, you aren't introducing bugs, that's huge. And that's the training aspect. And that's really the ultimate shift left. In a perfect world, as you know, there, is, there are no bugs in the code, right? You can write the code, you can test it, there's nothing there. You know, QA's happy because they didn't find a bug, you're happy because there wasn't uh, any extra work. The deployment goes smoothly and the customer's happy because everything works perfectly. If we can do the same thing for security, and security is a little bit easier because the vulnerabilities are known and the fixes to the vulnerabilities are known. In fact, I'm gonna talk a little in a few minutes about what if you do one thing, you're gonna eliminate most of the security vulnerabilities that exist, period. So if you internalize these things and we shift all the way to the left and we shift to the developer, then now we aren't talking about a cost we're saying that we have almost zero cost because the developers and the application development teams have internalized the requirements for security to a point that it's just done. There's no question about it. Now, a lot of people will say, you know, that's really hard. And the answer is yes. <laughs> Most things worth doing are hard. But what I'll tell you is this, 15, 20 years ago, there were fights about the fact of having QA. Developers didn't want to have QA people because it slowed them down. They had problems because there was too much process. Why do I need to use a QA person? I can test my own code. Well, I think that most people would agree that when you write your own code and you test your own code, a lot of times you're doing happy path and a lot of times you are not thinking about the other things that might happen inside your code. So what happened was QA stood up and QA started to be an integral process. Fantastic. It took a long time, but now most companies will not release to production without having gone through QA. It's an automatic thing. We're getting there with security where Right now, there's some pushback where, why do we need to do security scans? Why do we need to address security vulnerabilities? It's getting there, but pretty soon, what we're gonna see is 
people are not going to think about going to prod without having run a security scan. It's just going to be internalized. And that's really where we're looking to get to. And once again, we're going to be able to drive that cost to the company as close to zero as possible because of it. But I get the competing narratives, right? And imperatives. I get it. I've lived it. So development teams, you have a schedule. You have crazy schedules. You have dev leads and product owners that are asking for more and more in less and less time. So you have a schedule that you have to meet. You have enhancements that you have to put in. You have functionality that's being requested by the business. And while doing all of this, you're being told it has to be stable. That's really tough, especially when you start putting security in where security is like, hey, we found this vulnerability. It's like, well, it's not an enhancement and it's not added functionality. So it's tough to get that in there. But yeah, once you start thinking about it and internalizing it, you aren't gonna have to worry about it. But that's the development team imperative. The security team has a natural tension with the development team and what they're looking at is network security, application security, right? Is the network secure, what we're deploying into? Is the application secure, what is being deployed? We're also trying to limit the blast radius. So it's a great term. I first heard it talking with AWS uh, about how to do deployments in the cloud is limiting the blast radius. If something gets compromised, what impact is there? Are you talking about just a single surface? Are you talking about just a single server? Are you talking about an application or are you talking about an entire environment? The goal is that we limit the blast radius so that if something gets uh, owned, well, just that one thing gets owned. And like I said, there's a natural tension that exists between this and finding the happy ground in between is the goal of DevSecOps and the goal of shift left. So how do we do it? We've talked about why we do it and we've talked about what we need to do, but how do we actually do it? <clears throat> well, we start with the fact that security requirements must be clear and concise. Planning, right? I don't know if any of you have read The Mythical Man Month. If you haven't, I highly recommend it. It's a great book. Uh, I'm also a geek, so I, it spoke to me. But um, one of the things that I've, I took away from Mythical Man Month is the fact that approximately 50% of your time should just be in planning. You should just be thinking and architecting. And so what you do is we start to internalize these security requirements and we make sure that they're clear and concise. And what do I mean by that? They're, you know, we can say something like, hey, be secure. Well, that, that's not helpful, but we can say, sanitize all your data inputs. It's a little bit more helpful, but what we can say is something more specific, like you should not allow directory traversal, meaning you should not allow someone to be able to change the URL and walk a tree. That is very clear and very concise, and then you can s scope around it. So your security requirements must be clear and concise so that people can understand and integrate it early in the planning phase. Automation is the absolute key to increasing velocity. So manual processes are prone to error. Manual processes take longer. They take longer to actually do, and they take longer because a manual process, because it's prone to error, usually means that you have to go back and clean things up. So part of DevSecOps is automating these processes. And when we start to automate, we start to get increased velocity. Automation also deals with security and the shift left. If you start to automate security, you're removing the human from the equation. And what you're doing is you're creating a faster uh, process that is actually more secure. Effective training decreases risk. Training. So not just training. So not just training. If people could mute, that would be fantastic. I'm getting some feedback. Uh, but effective training. You know, if you go and you sit in front of a, uh, 
you know, a 45 minute slide presentation with no interaction. That is going to be less effective than sitting in a lab and writing code and having your code analyzed and getting immediate feedback. So what you want is effective training. You want to have that hands-on, you wanna be shown. I can speak about SQL injection, but I can guarantee the first time I show you how easy it is to do a SQL injection, well, that's gonna be the eye-opener. And by the way, each vulnerability, usually a half an hour to 45 minute topic just on its own, where you can deep dive into it. So what you wanna have is you wanna have that effective training and that decreases risk. And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, Dave, you're awesome. And I say, thank you very much, but we just met. Um, but so far you haven't talked at all about actually what to do in the shift left. And that's right, because right now, if we do these things, this is the foundation. This is what we can do. And then this is the planning phase for Mythical Man Month, the 50%, right? You're spending the time, you're automating, you're figuring out your processes, you're developing the training, you're ensuring that the security requirements are put in and they're concise and they're effective. So here's the nugget from what you should do. And if you understand only two security concerns, if you only have two takeaways from this entire presentation, take these away. An understanding of what a trust boundary is and an understanding of data sanitization. So what I have here is a simple box and line application, right? You have an end user, they go into your fantastic phenomenal application and that application interacts with your data store. Pretty simple. This can be a monolith, this is, can be microservices, whatever it is. Your application is your compiled code. So what is a trust boundary? This is the trust boundary. Trust boundary is your compiled code. Now, a lot of people will say, well, my trust boundary also includes my data. And the answer is no, it does not. If you think about it, your application, your compiled code is like your body. So everything internal to your body is trusted by your body. Your mind gives you, you know, uh, tells you things, your, you know, your heart beats, you digest food. All of these things are things you don't have to think about because it's trusted, because it's internal, it's within your trust boundary. Well, your data store is like your food. It's something that comes into your application, into your body. Do you trust it? Sometimes yes. Sometimes there's higher degrees of trust. If you have bought and cooked the food yourself, you have a higher degree of trust, but you know, do you still wash your vegetables? Do you still ensure that you know, your uh, food is cooked to a certain temperature? Right, because you still don't implicitly trust it. Now, sometimes there's gas station sushi from the desert. That's data that you really are suspect of, right? So what you wanna do in your trust boundary is you want to understand implicitly what you trust and what you don't trust. And the simple fact is anything outside of your compiled code can't be trusted. So what you have to do is you have to validate everything that comes into your application. Data sanitization, this is the validation part. What you wanna do when you're doing data sanitization is you wanna have known good over known bad. So what do I mean by that? Every time we write an application, every time we accept input, we implicitly understand that there are certain criteria that exist that we expect. You might be expecting a name. Well, there really aren't numbers or uh, characters other than alphanumeric or instead of alpha inside of the name. Usually there aren't numbers. 
definitely not things like alligator teeth or exclamation points or you know things like that. So what you do is you take your known good. You say, I know for a fact that the data parameter that I am accepting into my code should be this. If we use the example of a US zip code, we know for a fact that it's at least five characters, that they are numeric, that it may be up to nine char uh, 10 characters with a dash. So it might be five dash four, right? So what you can do is you can write a simple regex that says it might be five, it might be nine, if it's, uh, you know, it might be four dash, uh, five dash four. What this does is this allows you to be very specific. And when you do the known good, well, then what you're dealing with is a positive thing. It's, e it's harder to do the known good than the known bad at first, but it's easier to maintain. If you don't know exactly what you want, then you eliminate the known bad. So you sit there and you say, well, I absolutely know that I, it's only going to be numbers. Okay. Well, it's not as great as a reg regex that limits it down to a certain number and a certain type. But if you can just say, I'm only going to accept numerics and maybe a dash. Well, what you can do is you can say anything other than uh, numerics or dash, I'm not gonna accept. So what you're doing is you're sanitizing the data. You're validating the data as it comes in. You're making sure that things that are coming in from outside your trust boundary are conforming to the schema that has been developed for you. And you're validating the parameters as they come in. You're stripping out the things that don't make sense. If you do trust boundary and you do data sanitization, you're gonna address the bulk of vulnerabilities that actually exist inside of uh, any security environment. So shifting to the left, DevSecOps. What do we learn? Automation allows for velocity and integration. That's a whole CICD DevOps pipeline. Shifting security to the left reduces schedule impacts. What we can do is by eliminating uh, security vulnerabilities found later in the process, identifying them earlier and fixing them earlier, your schedules are going to be intact. That when you are doing training, you're decreasing introduced vulnerabilities. Decreasing the introduced vulnerabilities reduces schedule impacts, reduces risk to the company. Reducing schedule impacts and vulnerabilities just decreases cost and risk. So shifting left by thinking about security, by thinking about the vulnerabilities, by thinking about bugs early and often in the process means that you are reducing risk to both your schedule, to your company, to your business, and to your reputation. So questions? Feel free to also say that you have total and complete understanding and mastery of the entire process. Thanks a lot for the talk. Maybe we'll give you a virtual clap. Uh, well, one, thank you. <laughs> yeah, any questions from the audience? Okay, I see one question in the chat. Okay, so the question goes, uh, how does uh, Devonshire work on industry cybersecurity? Uh, yeah, so, sorry, I wrote it wrongly. I wanted to ask you uh, how DevOps work on cybersecurity sit situations that are on industrial settings where the devices and the IoT may be older and uh, the, the outcome could be dangerous, more dangerous physically. Right. So DevOps itself is just a methodology. So it's going to work just as well in IoT or in industrial settings. So I get it CIC, uh, you know, machinery and things like that. What DevOps is doing is it's ensuring that by doing smaller deployments, you're having that security uh, built into it. So right now, if you're doing, you know, say, like you're saying, legacy, maybe CIC, um, 
you know, machinery, you probably have some sort of test machinery or test bed or test harness that you do your deployment to and you run all your testing against. So you write your code, you, you know, it's like kernel development, right? You write your code, you do your compiles, you get everything going, and then you deploy it to some test bed that allows for that testing. Well, DevOps, what it's doing is it's integrating that, that um, test environment really throughout the entire process so that you're doing small little changes and you're doing individual testing. And what you're doing is you're also making sure that things are secure. So, you know, one of the things people don't think about is IoT and, um, you know, older types of um, machinery and kernel development. They're actually more apt for uh, security vulnerabilities because a lot of people don't think about it. The example I can give is I, I know it was a bank. I believe it was in Singapore, might be, might have been Thailand, where there was a data breach that happened because they actually had an unpatched HTTP server sitting on an aquarium inside of their network, and that provided the ingress point that allowed for a breach to happen because in your, you know, with you, it's IOT, right? So, but if you look at it, the actual vulnerability itself was an unpatched HTTP server. Well, that can be handled in a DevOps situation. You just have to be aware that that is a potential threat vector. So did that answer the question? Uh, yes, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. No worries. Uh, any other questions? I had a question. Um, one, uh, in your experience, you know, what are the number of engineers that um, practice secure code practices? And in your mind, you know, obviously it's a spectrum. It's not like zero or one. There's a right, level right. Of, of carefulness, but, you know, what would you, you know, what are the number of engineers that you would consider careful enough, you know, and what is that dichotomy? Because obviously, you know, if, if this was higher, you know, we wouldn't have to worry as much about security, but, you know. Uh, well, right. And what I find is the curriculums are changing, right? So just recently, there've started to be bachelor's and master's offered in cybersecurity. And in speaking with some of my interns, they are starting to have cybersecurity and information security classes involved with their curriculum. So I think people are starting to think about it. But what I have found is in general, most uh, computer science engineers don't really think about security. They're looking at things from the lens of application development and how do they optimize their code. So a lot of times security and optimization are actually another thing that are intention, right? If you're looking to optimize your code, but you have to run your input parameters through a data, data sanitization process, that takes a little bit of time. It adds a little bit of overhead. So what I find is that a lot of engineers aren't thinking about it to begin with. But what I also find is when you do the discussions and you speak in development terms about things and you talk about the actual impact and the reason why, and if you can get that understanding of why, I find that the engineers internalize it almost immediately and then they start to actually do it. So I guess the short answer to your question is, in general, coming into the workplace, I don't see a lot of engineers thinking about security, but once you get into it and companies are talking about security, I see that, uh, that security being internalized very rapidly and being implemented as well. Thank you. Sure. Okay, I see a question from uh, Yoshi. Yoshi. Yoshi, would you like to? Uh, Ask the question. Uh, yeah. So hi, um, my, I'm Yoshi. Uh, so as far as I've seen, well, thank you for the presentation. First of all, um, it was really informative. Um, I, from the presentation I see in today, the ship's web mindset seems to work on like a central situation where 
um, the company has servers maybe on their premise or in the cloud. Um, and uh, I think, you know, uh, de uh, defining the trust zones and trust boundaries and also tenantizing the data seems to work in that kind of situation. But um, in the current like, you know, world, we also have companies deploying their um, applications to some users' phones, for example, like you know, the bank mm -hmm. apps. Um, they deploy their apps on like you know, user phones to increase the convenience. Does the same idea, the shift left idea, apply to those kind of situations? So the short answer is yes. <laughs> um, you know, the shift left, even if you're doing like a phone deployment, you're still doing a DevOps type approach where you're developing your code and you're doing your deployment. You know, the trust boundary, especially for like a banking app on your phone is you can actually ensure that, you, you know, there's containerization so that you're putting your application into a secure aspect of the memory on the phone. Um, so there are those security considerations and there's, there's a whole wealth of topics just on, you know, mobile security, mobile app security. But the idea really is even on the phone, you want to make sure that you have that trust boundary, you have that, you're validating the data as it comes in. <clears throat> you know, whenever you're entering information, you're being constantly checked and told, you know, incorrect account, you know, incorrect, you know, password, whatever it might be. All of that is security that's happening. And, you know, to your point also about like, you know, environments, shifting left also works for, you know, infrastructure as code when you're talking about ephemeral environments that are, uh, you know, cloud expanded on demand and things like that. What you do is, I love infrastructure as code because you can secure it easier because you can run the infrastructure as code through validation processes that ensure that what it's actually being deployed meets all of the requirements that you need to be able to be secure. Did that answer your question? Yes. Well, thank okay. you so much. No worries. Okay. Uh, so maybe I will ask one last question before uh, we go to Tobias as well. Uh, so uh, yeah, this is fascinating. Uh, but I was wondering what you think about the role of um, like automated analysis tools, you know, such mm -hmm. as fuzzers and, you know, like more secure languages, you know, such as Rust and this whole uh, picture. Well, I love them. And I think that it's the, you know, it's the ultimate outcome of starting to think about security and shift left is having these automations built into the integration, like I said, especially when you're talking about uh, deployment and operational where, what you're doing is, you know, to your point, you know, fuzzing the, the inputs and things like that. It allows you to identify those edge cases and automation definitely has its place and automation can identify usually about 90 to 95% of the vulnerabilities that exist out there, which gets you to a great place. <laughs> now the other 5% or 10%, that's where you need to have the human go in and look at what, what was generated and figure out, do you want to continue that and try to get to closer to 100%. The higher on your confidence level you get, the higher the cost. So that's always a trade-off inside of the business is what level is good enough, is secure enough, so that we can have a confidence level. And it's all based on risk. So, you know, I really like, you know, I asked, stat, you know, SAST, DAS tools, things that are happening. There's IDE uh, implementations now where you can be writing your code and you can do a quick check and it will identify if you've introduced a security vulnerability as you're writing your code. You know, all of that allows for an identification early in the process that allows things to be addressed as quickly as possible. Great, makes sense. Any more questions? Okay, uh, thanks. Thank you again. And right, time. So, Thank uh, you. Yeah, as I mentioned, I think Tobias wants to talk a little bit about the uh, team and hiring opportunities. So, uh, Tobias, do you have any slides to share? I do. I could just to give you, given the time, a bit of an idea. 
Uh, but our team, this picture in the background, by the way, is taken from our office when it used to be open. Um, it's not exactly a skyscraper. Um, so and am I enabled? Because I think I don't have the rights if I check it out. To uh, let me give you... Uh, I can give the short version on the voice track. Um, and send let the link. me make you the co-host and you will be able to share anything uh, you want on the screen. Also, if you can't can't share it, you can send it to me, uh, Tobias, and I can share it and you can speak to it. Okay, I think it works now. Let me double check not to lose any time. I see your desktop. Yep. Okay. I mean, uh, the short version, uh, we are here around the corner in Newport Beach. Uh, we have, a, I would say, a great team culture, engineering culture, and we are hiring. <laughs> That's the short version. Um, just to give you a bit of an idea why SAP is in Newport Beach, also interesting for UCI. Uh, not because of me, but by coincidence, I used to be a PhD student over here like 15 years ago under a different last name, That's, but it's a longer story. Um, but what happened actually is that our um, one of our founders he, uh, he lives around the corner and actually he was told very good things about UCI and that, you know, they are front running or already machine learning as an instant, as an instant. He said, well, we need to do something here. And this, we need to do something here ended up in me jumping on the plane with my family like two and a half years ago. Um, in essence, mm -hmm. so um, I think Dave didn't talk too much about SAP, but the short version is SAP is, I think, fair to say, the operating system of the world's economy. If you look into the figures, um, you will see that uh, I think close to 90% of the world's transactions or 80 something percent touch an SAP uh, system at some point. So if you see the size, uh, more than 100,000 employees, over 30,000 in engineering, um, you see the annual revenue, I think this is even last year, just to give you an idea and also how security multiplies out in our company. And you see also that we deal both with the, the big customers, but we are also offering solutions for smaller companies. Um, the team in Newport Beach, and these are the figures as of last year. So we definitely have more countries represented by now. The average age is maybe, yeah, probably the same, but uh, definitely more female workers by now. We started in uh, July last year. Right now, I think we are 50 plus people. Uh, it's kind of hard to guess because we are working from home at the moment. This is the, actually the picture in the background is the, the actual view you have from the back of the building. Um, and you can get a coffee there and you know, um, take a look, look at the, this is the inner bay behind the well, Boa Peninsula. Um, so I already mentioned, so we're here for, for one year. The entire place was officially inaugurized in um, September. Last year, we had a big event with the mayor of Newport Beach, the head of the Chamber of Commerce, um, Hasso Plattner himself, one of the founders, and a good amount of board members. So you saw the front side of the building. This is the, uh, the back side, or however you want to take it. This is the front side. The other one was the back side. Uh, and, and sorry, this is not the average company car we have, uh, but just some visitor to the HANA house. Um, the charming thing about this place is that HANA House is per se an open space. So anyone can go there, grab a coffee, um, rent a room, uh, work from there. And this is by intention. So one of the ideas of Faso Platner was, hey, creating an innovative space for engineers that also has a, um, an API, so to say, to the outside world, um, potential customers, students, um, investors, and, and what have you. So really, I mean, I was lucky enough until March to be um, working in that kind of environment. A glimpse inside. Uh, this is one of our um, events. It's not a standard Scrum event, but uh, every Friday we have the so-called Hacker Lunch, where all the teams um, that work on one product present their, um, their new features um, in a kind of a yeah, powwow, concise format. Um, in general, uh, we have a good track record, so to, to work very, um, very hands-on and visually using also the space. Right now we are transferring a lot of this on, on, uh, on Mural, uh, which is the next best thing. What you see, and this is Jörn here, our big boss, 
um, on his last visit. So culture is really important for us and we, we created this culture from the inside out and just a few keywords. Trust is important, especially now that everybody's home and doesn't see each other. Um, ownership, being responsible for what you do. And I think this connects well to security as well. Uh, being innovative, okay, this is the mission we are sent on here. And it all starts with the customers. Um, we grew quite substantially, um, 11 teams um, worldwide in, in our subgroup alone. As I said, 50 plus people in, in Newport Beach. And uh, yeah, we want to keep on growing um, as we have now more products in our portfolio. I think the easiest way to access or to get an idea is go to um, careersacp.com, type in Newport Beach, and you, this is a screenshot I just take before the, the call here. And you see a couple of things that, you know, DevOps, DevSecOps, it's definitely a topic. We're hiring both for senior positions and, and, and entry positions. So we'll see all of that. You can get a glimpse here. In general, SDP Global also has an entry point for students and graduates here. So you would see all kinds of job um, for, for you worldwide. Um, yeah, this was just a short version, the fast version, sorry. Uh, same as Dave, um, you find me on LinkedIn with the old name and a new name, uh, the same picture. And uh, I guess we don't have any more time for questions, but at least the content questions were, were answered. So thanks a lot. And just following up on what uh, Tobias said, I have actually recommended uh, at least one person I know to attempt to apply. So I usually don't do a recommendation to a company unless I believe in it. And this is a great company. Awesome, yeah, sounds great. I'm sure our students are interested and will be in touch. Uh, are there any questions? Like, I think if there's like one or two, we should be able to take them. Okay, so it seems like we don't have any questions. All right, David and Tobias, thank, thank you again. This was great. Uh, uh, yeah, like we all enjoyed it. Yeah, thank you very much. All right, thank you.